Good morning and welcome to Polar Regions session four. Uh, if you don't grab yourself a pencil and a scrap piece of paper because we're going to need it in today's session. And we started off with this little bit of a challenge for you. Can you make as many polar keywords as you can out of these letters? How many did you get? Did you get the Arctic? Maybe you made Antarctica. Um, did you, you could get polar? So that was an obvious one. Uh, sea ice, ice sheets, uh, ice, um, and the North Pole. For some reason, I didn't think it was a sea there then. I was a bit panicking that I'd asked you to make a um, word that you couldn't actually make. Well done if you got any of those or any of the other ones. Um, that are linked to the polar keyword. So welcome, welcome to our session. I've got actually my warm extra fleecy jumper on today because we're doing the polar regions and it's still really, there's no snow this week, but it's still very cold outside, but definitely probably not as cold as it is in the polar regions. Now today, what we're going to be looking at last week, you were looking at different animals and we were looking at how those animals had adapted and I set you off uh, to research some of those animals and produce some work on it. So if you did, do feel free to share it um, on the chat on Facebook because uh, I'd love to see what you got up to last week or alternatively you can always go and share it uh, via DM or over in our Facebook group. But this week we're going to move on. So last week we looked at animals this week we're going to look at vegetation um, and plants um, and all of those sorts of uh, things like plants and uh, photoplankton, all those sorts of things that are living that aren't animals. So vegetation is the word we tend to use. Um, and I think this is even more incredible than animals, but we're going to look at how vegetation has adapted to the polar environment and why actually that is pretty epic. Now, there are very few plants that can survive on an ice sheet. Um, and so if you go into the um, ice sheets of the Arctic um, or you go into the centre of Antarctica, where um, although it, it is land, there's huge ice sheets on top of the land. You're not going to find any plants there. And that doesn't really need any explanation, does it? Plants do need um various things to survive and particularly they need um you know some sort of nutrition and so therefore um when you're looking at the adaptations of plants in the polar region we're generally talking about the tundra um and the tundra is kind of those uh, aspect those sort of outer uh, areas of the arctic and those kind of sort of peninsula areas of Antarctica. And that's where you're going to find most plant species are found. Um, and so the tundra um, is the area because it does actually have soil. However, that said, that soil, um, uh, the, those layers of soil and those rocks are quite often permanently frozen. Um, but that's the main place you're going to find, which is why we're talking about the centre of the Arctic, where those Arctic ice sheets are, and Antarctica in the centre, that's why you know it's a desert, because nothing can grow there. But generally, it's a tundra. And so this is a tundra, and so this is uh, what I want you to look at. I want you to look at this, and I'll turn my camera so you can see. What do you think the characteristics are of this landscape? So put your physical geography hat on. What do you notice about this kind of landscape? Um, and what do you predict the plants will be like here? How do you think these plants are surviving here? But what do you notice um, the characteristics and light of this landscape? So we've got quite a thin layer of soil. So that's something to consider. Thinking therefore, there's a kind of how the plants might be. What do you think their root system might be? If the soil is potentially very thin or frozen, what do you think the root system is going to be like? What else do you notice about it? 
So the plants aren't very big, are they? Yeah, really good idea. The plants aren't particularly tall. You're not seeing big, bushy things. Right, I want you to keep this in mind because this is really going to help us. This is a photograph of the tundra. And so if you've got the fact that there's a really thin layer of soil, then you're absolutely right. And so there's only like this really thin layer of soil where plants can grow. And then below this, you have the subsoil and the rock. And the subsoil and the rock are frozen all year round. And this is called a permafrost. So you sometimes hear this word permafrost. And this basically means the soil and the rock, which is permanently frozen. So due to the temperatures all year round, you have this permafrost um, in the tundra and these areas are permanently frozen and it's only this really thin layer of soil where plants can grow. So this is what I wanted you to get your uh, pencil and your paper for, or you can just have a think if you don't like drawing, I'm not gonna put you off, but have a really quick sketch of this and I've got lots and lots of different question marks here. I've got four question marks. What is permafrost? And what do you think these layers actually are? So you can just do a really quick sketch um, because that's a really important geography skill. So doing a really quick sketch. Whoops. Camera's going all funny. So do a really quick sketch and then work out what you think those layers are. So what do you think the top layer is? A bit like a cake, isn't it? What do you think the next layer is? And what do you think that huge, big, fat layer is? And what do you think the bit at the bottom is? And obviously you can see the little plants right at the top. What do we think? And just give you a few more seconds to give yourself a bit more of a sketch if you're doing the sketching. I'm going to go through what a permafrost is. So hopefully you've got your vegetation. Now this top bit is soil. It is a thin layer of soil. So if you've got that as soil, then that's correct. But actually the geography term is this is known in a permafrost. Uh, this is known as the active layer. So if you want to add that, if you're doing a diagram, you can add that on. This is the active layer. And this is basically a thin layer of soil, and this is where any plants in the tundra will grow. Now, this soil does freeze in the winter, so no, nothing really grows even in the tundra during the winter, um, but a bit like here in the winter, nothing really grows. But then in the summer, this active layer thaws, and so this is what allows vegetation to grow in uh, the tundra. Then you have underneath it frozen soil. So this is always frozen. And then under that is frozen rock. So you have your active layer and then you have what's known as subsoil. Uh, and you have subsoil in your garden. The top layer is known as soil, or you can call that your active layer where you might grow some plants. And then underneath that is your subsoil. And then you have um, this frozen, frozen rock which is, is in certain, certain areas in the tundra, really quite a big uh, section um, of, the, um, of the layer of the earth. And then obviously, as you're getting closer to the core of the earth, even when you're up in the, in the um, Arctic or the Antarctic, you then get to the point where it doesn't freeze anymore because it's close to um, the, um, the mantle um, and the, uh, you know the hot layers of the earth but you've got your active layer your frozen subsoil and then your frozen rock um, and that's the sort of surface and then obviously it will as I said get a bit more it will then start to go unfrozen as it's getting because that's just the crust if you think if you've ever done tectonics we're just talking about the crust because underneath the crust you've obviously got your uh, mantle and things like that <clears throat> So therefore, we're looking at a place where it has very cold temperatures, often minus 50, very low rainfall, strong winds, and this very short growing season where you've got this thin layer of soil, which is actually soil. And the other thing to say, though, is that this thin layer of soil, if it's been covered in an ice sheet for winter, often can actually become really waterlogged because it holds a lot of water in this top layer 
And so this is really quite extreme conditions for anything to grow in. It's very cold, there's very rain, low rainfall to actually water uh, the plants. It's often strong winds and this thin, it's a thin layer of soil. Uh, everything underneath it's frozen solid. And then this thin layer of soil is potentially also waterlogged. So it's a really, really extreme condition for anything to grow in. And so that's why I find vegetation more fascinating than animals. So why are there no trees in the tundra? In, we're not going to be looking at trees today. And the reason is because there's no way a tree, I'm sure you've worked out, can survive in such a thin layer of soil. So therefore, what does survive? What does grow? Um, in the polar environment. Well, funnily, sort of really surprisingly, there's around 1,700 species of plants on the Arctic tundra. And these are all quite small plants, so they're often dwarf shrubs or grasses, lichen, um, and they have adapted to survive in these extreme conditions. But you're never going to find a big bushy tree. They are all kind of dwarf shrubs, lichen, mosses, grasses, and small kind of flowering uh, plants. And so these things have adapted various things. They have uh, adapted this fact that they're very compact. They grow really close to the ground. They actually have very hairy stems. So if you go and look at any plant in the tundra, a lot of them have really hairy stems. The plants have small needle-like leaves, so very, very different. If you look at something like the rainforest, where you've got really big leaves, in the tundra you have plants that have really small needle-like leaves. Needle-like leaves, that's hard to say. And then the plants have really shallow roots. So why? So we've got a heads and tails thing here. So I've told you uh, the things that the plants have on the left, but why? So why are they compact and grow close to the ground? Why do they have hairy stems? Why do they have small leaves? And why do they have shallow roots? So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to see if you can work out, because it's all muddled up. On the other side is tails. So which one matches which? So plants are compact and grow close to the ground to trap, help trap heat near the plant and act as protection from the wind. Does that match? Mm, not sure whether it does. So can you match the heads to the tails? Can you work out which two uh, things uh, work together? So many tundra plants have hairy stems. Which one of those tails matches it? Make sense? Right, you've got 30 seconds. Off you go. Right, what do we think? So I can see some answers coming in. Shall we go through them? Well, these are the correct answers. So the plants are compact and they grow close to the ground. And this is so they're not damaged by the wind. So if you think about if we have a if we have a really windy day, the grass, or if you've got grass on your lawn, it, if you've got a or you know a little patch of grass, or if you go look at grass in a country park, if you don't have a garden. The grass, it won't like blow a little bit, but it's pretty okay. You don't ever say, oh, that wind, that wind was awful last night. It's totally destroyed all my grass. You just don't, it doesn't happen. But if you've got like a really big tree or quite a big branch, or you go to the park and you see trees, they are really susceptible to damage by the wind. In fact, they often even blow down in serious winds. And so because the polar regions can be very windy, the plants grow really, really close to the ground, and that means they're protected by the wind. 
they have hairy stems and they have hairy stems because their hairy stems trap uh, in the heat. Now, if you've got, uh, if you've got, look at your arm, your arm will have fine hairs all over them. And when you're cold and you get goosebumps, it's because your hairs are standing up on end. And sometimes you can't actually see it, but that's what your goosebumps are doing. They're making all your hairs stand on end. And that's to trap, that's because you're often cold and it's to trap uh, the heat into your body. And so tundra plants do the same. They have these hairy stems and it helps protect uh, and keep them a bit warmer. They have really small needle-like leaves to reduce any water loss from the leaf surface. So if, it, if they've, you know, if they're, if they're well hydrated and it is a bit sunny, it won't be hot, but it stops uh, the water loss from the leaf surface. And they obviously have those shallow roots, shallow roots to avoid the permafrost. Uh, so they can only grow little roots because there's only this small area of active soil. Right, the next one. Some plants can grow on bare rock. The flowers, some of the plants, they actually, the flowers twist to follow the sun. The plants have developed so that they can photosynthesize in extremely cold weather, so they can make their energy through photosynthesis even when it's really cold. And if there is um, a deluge of snow, they are able to survive and grow under a layer of slow, snow. So look at the tails, which one matches? So vegetation can grow on bare rock, which one of the tails matches? The flowers can twist to follow the sun, well why? Look at the tails, which one matches? I'm gonna give you another 30 seconds, are you ready? Off you go. Right, so go through the answers. So vegetation can grow on bare rock. And the reason behind this is because if there's very little soil or the soil is frozen, some plants have adapted to being able to grow on bare rock, which is just absolutely incredible. You can sometimes in the garden centre actually find those special types of plants that can do that. They're often maybe on like a little wooden log um, or in a shell and you just, uh, they, they don't need soil. Really, really clever. Flowers can twist to the sun, and that's important because it allows them to photosynthesize longer. So it allows them to photosynthesize for longer during the day as those flowers are twisting. They can synthesize in extreme, photosynthesize in extremely cold weather. So it means that even if it's really cold um, and there's a lack of sunlight, it means that they can still create the energy they need to survive. Um, and they're able to survive uh, under a layer of snow so that when that snow drops and those ice sheets come back, it allows that species to survive over the winter. Because if you think about it, they have to be, even if they're dormant, so like our trees, a lot of our trees, our deciduous trees, um, are dormant during the winter, but they're still alive, they're just dormant, they lose all their leaves, they suck all their energy into their trunk. You can start to see signs of life now with those buds. Um, and it's the same with lots of, you know, if you've got bulbs like daffodils. So you think that they're under the ground um, and then, you know, when it starts to warm up, then they regrow. Well, they're not dead under the ground. They're still alive and then they, re they grow their stems and their flowers when we've got spring and it starts to warm up. And it's the same idea. These plants are able to survive and some of them even grow even if they're under a layer of snow. And that's important for them to survive through those extreme conditions, which I just think is absolutely incredible. So these are some examples 
of plants if you are interested to go and find out some more. So the Arctic willow is an example of, I've turned my camera so you can see better, the Arctic willow is an example of a plant that grows incredibly close to the ground. But you see its leaves, how close, it's hardly got any real stem at all. And you can see that all of the leaves are really close to the ground. It looks very different to plants that we have today. And then you have the Arctic crocus. That's a really good example of a plant that has a hairy stem. You can go and Google an Arctic crocus or do a search engine for an Arctic crocus, should I say. You'll find lots of examples and be able to show you where, uh, how hairy its stem is. Um, Arctic moss is an example of something that has really, really small waxy needles. So um, lots of moss is a bit like that. Um, and they also have those really shallow root systems. So Arctic moss is another one to go and look at. Uh, lichen. Um, so this is caribou lichen. This is an example of a plant that can survive on bare rock. It can live where there's very little soil or the soil is frozen. And this is what reindeers like to eat far more than uh, so real, you know, reindeer really tend to eat lichen. It's only uh, Father Christmas or Santa reindeer that eat carrots. Uh, but caribou lichen is the favourite. Well, Santa's reindeer like lichen too. But lichen is a favourite food of the reindeer. And that's an example of a plant that can survive on bare rock. And the Arctic poppy is an example of a plant that where you can look. Um, and again, go and see if you can find some videos of how the flowers twist to follow the sun. And as I said, all tundra plants can survive under thick layers of snow and they can photosynthesize even in really extreme weather. Now, I think that that is some pretty impressive adaptations. But what I want you to think about is what do you think is the most impressive adaptation? What do you think is um, pretty epic. Now for me it's being able to survive under the snow because our soil gets cold enough and I find it fascinating that our plants can still grow when it comes to the spring, particularly something like a daffodil where you see it beautifully grow out this time of year when you think how it's been uh, cold and dormant uh, in the soil. But what do you think is the most impressive adaption? Have a little think and maybe have a chat with somebody at home. Now if you wish what you could do is you could think about these adaptions even further and you could, if you wish, um, try your hand at a GCSE exam question for geography. So this is an example of a GCSE exam question and the question is explain how vegetation has adapted to the polar environment. Now it's worth six marks and six marks basically means that you have to have three examples and you have to explain them. And if you write three examples and you explain how that's an adaption, you'd get six marks. So you could talk about the plant, the, the um, flowers rotating towards the sun and why. You could talk about the shallow root system and why. You could talk about being able to grow on bare rock and why. You could talk about the small little needles and why. And so if you just use three examples and explain them, then that would give you those six marks. So if you're looking for something to do after this session, uh, explain how vegetation has adapted to the polar environment. Now, this is an example of the mark screen. If you just uh, give a simple answer, so if you say um, they can grow on bare rock, their, plant, their flowers can move to face the sun and their root systems are shallow, then you'd get one mark for each of those. If you can explain each of those, you would get two marks for each well-explained example of plant adaption. So for example, this is one, some tundra plants such as the caribou lichen are able to grow on bare rock. This is important if there is little soil or the soil is frozen. So you can use that, this is important. Uh, so if you'd like to have a go at a GCSE question, then have a go. You're more than welcome to send them to me via DM and I will happily mark them for you. Um, and that is the end of this session because these are sessions obviously for older learners. And what I want you to kind of go and do now 
is find and um, learn a little bit more about plant adaption. So just like you did last week with the animals, I'd like you to go off and look at some of these plant adaptions, how the plants have adapted, um, and what's you know what is fascinating about it. And then if you want, answer that exam style question and send it over because I'd love to mark it for you. And I will see you next week where we are going to look at how humans have adapted to living in the Arctic. I will see you next week. Have a lovely week and I'll see you 